everyone, welcome back to Cowabunga Corner. In this episode, I am very, very stoked to have Barry Gordon, the original, original voice of Donatello. <laughs> when we hear Donatello's voice, everyone's usually trying to mimic him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is really bizarre since it's just my voice. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, It's really an honor to have you on the show. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you pleasure Michelle oh it's been a thrill I remember back in the day reading the credits yeah. and trying to figure out who everyone was and not having any way of finding out until I start watching other shows and matching names up and then in 1991 we got a magazine that had a picture of you Townsend and Rob in it <laughs> and I'm like Finally, faces to the names. But uh, I found out later that what I was doing was called voice chasing because I was actually trying to find oh, out which shows you were in sure, and sure. who everyone was. And it was great to find out, finally confirm, yes, this is Donatello's name and everything. So getting to sit here and talk with you, it's a real honor. Well, thank, thank you. you. Uh, how did you get into acting? Oh, my. Um, I was very, very young. Um, I was, uh, actually I got into singing first, so I was uh, three years old, um, and since I'm 63, that was 60 years ago, <laughs> um, and I was three years old, and I did a show that was kind of uh, the 1950s version of uh, American Idol, you know, which was called the Ted Mack Amateur Hour. And they would have these people from across the country and, you know, doing different things. And, um, and a, a neighbor actually submitted me because I used to kind of go around and sing for the neighbors for cookies and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and treats. And so um, uh, a neighbor submitted me. We, we didn't realize it. And um, this card comes in the mail saying, you know, you've been selected to audition. We lived in Albany, New York, and so they, they said you've been selected to audition for what's called the Tri-City um, competition, which was Albany, Schenectady, and Troy. And so, uh, you know, my father asked me. I was three years old, but he still, you know, said, you want to do this? And I said, yeah, because I loved singing for people. And I went, and you know, the first thing that happened was uh, my uh, my father was told, you know, you really shouldn't bring your kid with you. And he said, no, <laughs> no he's he's the one that's doing the auditioning. So um, I sang a song, and I got on the national show. I, I won that competition. I got on the national show, and then I came in second nationally uh, to uh, an orphans choir. Um, so I was not going to beat that. Uh, I, I, I totally recognize that. Um, so, but from there, um, I was uh, selected by a man who was a kind of a manager guy of kids. He was like a manager of kids. He had Connie Francis and he had Bobby Darren. He had those people. And so he had this little show in New York called Star Time which was a show which featured kids from, uh, at that time it was like from six or seven to, you know, 19. Um, and, uh, and I went on and was the youngest then at, at four. And so went on that show and then started to do a lot of stuff. And then gradually I started to add acting to it because I would be on different shows like, you know, Jackie Gleason show or Milton Berle show. And I'd be asked to do a sketch as well as sing. And so that's kind of how I learned comedy. And then I did a movie um, when I was, well, first I had a record. I had a hit record called Nothing for Christmas. And um, that was a, a big success. And then that led to a movie called The Girl Can't Help It, which was kind of the first rock and, big rock and roll movie with Jane Mansfield. And that was my first kind of part, you know, doing a character um, all the way through a movie. That's cool. And I did that. And, um, and then kind of uh, kept singing, but that never really surfaced again. You know, I had a couple of little minor hits after that. Um, but mostly I was an actor. And then uh, I acted on TV, on film, on Broadway, and then uh, uh, started to settle in more to a TV career. And um, 
and I got a voiceover agent, you know, just thinking, you know, I'm, I would do that. And, uh, and that's what ultimately led to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And the, the Quick Bunny. <laughs> yeah, the Quick Bunny first. It oh. The Quick Bunny was first, 19, gosh, I want to say, and I'm going to say, 72. Wow. Um, and I was the Quick Bunny for 36 years. That is amazing. Yeah, it was a, it was a long, long time, but uh, <laughs> um, um, I, that was uh, a fun thing. They didn't know whether they wanted, interestingly, they didn't know if they wanted it to be a bunny because they were creating this new character because they weren't sure they were going to go with the, you know, the old character was like Farfel, remember? Yeah. Nestle's makes the very best chocolate, mm -hmm. right? So they didn't know they were going to create a new character and they didn't know if they were going to do a bunny or, believe it or not, a turtle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so they had me read kind of, you know, a bunny voice and they had me read kind of a turtle voice, you know, which was a little slower and dumber. And so <laughs> they weren't Ninja Turtles, believe yeah. me. This was a different turtle. <laughs> yes. But they went with the bunny. Wow. And, uh, and uh, I did that for a very, very, very long time. Were you working on any other shows as a uh, lead character or anything? Uh, I know SWAT Cats and stuff came up before, later, but the yes, four turns. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I was trying to think of the first one that I did, and I can't remember the first one that I did. Um, I know that one of the early ones was Pac-Man. Awesome. And I was Inky in Pac-Man. And another one that someone reminded me of that I didn't even remember I did was the Mighty Orbots. And I did not remember doing that, but I, apparently I did it. <laughs> and then Snorks. And I was Junior Snork. So, so, um, so those had happened. There were some more uh, Hanna-Barbera things, but I can't remember what they were specifically. A big Pac-Man and Snorks fan back in the 80s. Really? I, yeah, yeah, I, I love both yeah. of those shows. So. But those predated um, Turtles. So. Yeah. yeah. Now, how were you approached with uh, the Ninja Turtle audition? The usual way. You know, you get a call from your agent, and he says, you know, you're going out for Hanna-Barbera Snorks, or you're going out for this or that. And he said, you're going out for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I said, you have nothing better to do than to call me up and, you know, and <laughs> make stupid jokes. You know, <laughs> what am I really going out for? And he said, you're going out for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I said, what the heck is that? And he said, well, go and find out. So I went, and, and you don't get a whole script. You just get, you know, sides. Yeah. But I looked at the sides, and I said, this is really funny. It's funny. It's hip. It's clever. Um, and um, I really liked it from, from the minute I... I read it and then um, read for it, talked to my agent again, and I said, I don't know if anything will happen with this. Because remember, it was only a five episode thing. Yeah. That's all it was supposed to be. It was a, it was a five episode thing they were putting on, I think it was on Channel 13 or something, you know, out here. So it was five episodes, and I said, I don't know if anything's going to happen with this, but this is really funny stuff. It's, you know, it's clever stuff. It reminded me in a totally different way of the cleverness of like Rocky and Bullwinkle. It just, it yeah. just had a hipness to it that I could relate to as an adult um, that I really enjoyed reading when I, when I just went for the audition. And I said, I have no idea, but I said, I, I found it very funny, very clever. So, but I still, I never, thought that I had no idea that this thing was going to become the phenomenon that it became. I really didn't because I wasn't familiar with the graphic novels um, and uh, but it just kept growing and growing and growing and from the five and then you know switching to CBS and you know becoming a regular Saturday morning show um, it was it was um, quite amazing and it just kept going and going and going so now, early on, they decided that you guys were doing more than just the turtle voices. How did you end up with the role of Bebop? How did I end up with the role? That's a wonderful question that I probably can't remember the answer no. to. Um, because a lot of the time, they just say, you do this, you do that, you know? 
and if you don't suck, then you, you keep it. <laughs> so, so it was probably that kind of a situation, right? Where, where they said, okay, we've got these other characters, because you always do other characters. Yeah. So, you know, they said, okay, well, we have other characters, because I did other characters on Snorks, you know. So, so they, I think they pointed to Cam and me, and they said to Cam, well, you, you do Rocksteady, you do Bebop. Now, did you have a that picture to create Bebop's voice to go off? Yes. Of? We had some uh, some cells to look at. Not finished, not cells, uh, you know, the drawings. Yeah, the original artwork. Yeah, the original cells. artwork. And we had those to look at. So, yeah, we, we were able to do that. And I saw him, and he just looked like a big, dumb guy to me. So I just did that. <laughs> so, <laughs> he just looked like a big New York dumb guy to me. So... Now, with uh, doing the, the cartoons, uh, how often were you in recording? I think once we started with CBS, we were once a week. Uh, but I'm trying, I think there were a couple of times that were twice. Um, I missed a few yeah. because I became president of the Screen Actors Guild, so I had to travel uh, for negotiations oh. and I couldn't get out of it. And so um, uh, the producer decided uh, not to, you know, because we asked, we said, can I do it wild? You know, can I wild line it? You know, because I'm yeah. just going to be gone for a few weeks. So can I wild line it, come back and wild line some episodes? And they said no. So they, um, so Greg Berg has done uh, maybe five shows or something. It was definitely noticed when you and Rob were not there. Yeah. Cam yeah. and Townsend was able to go all the way through, but right. you and Rob, right. like the Europe episodes, you were both replaced during that. It That's was, right. I'm like, oh, the voices sound okay. I'll still watch, but it sounds yeah. off. Yeah. It, it yeah. really does. When when you're watching a series, any producers or anything out there watching it, this uh, if you're watching a series and you're really into the cartoon and the voices change in the middle of the series yeah. for like yeah. a couple episodes. It's noticeable. <laughs> well, I mean, they had a choice, which was, and, and I understand, I can understand sort of the reasoning, okay. which is we had such a good fit, you know, working together, Yeah. that he might have thought that to try to do, you know, a series of episodes with wild lines wouldn't have worked, and so it's better to just get someone else to have the same camaraderie, but I don't think it quite works that way. Yeah. So it, it was unusual because generally in cartoons they do work around your schedule and you know particularly since you know you're not making that much money. <laughs> um, <laughs> you you know scale for cartoons is not huge <laughs> so you're not making that much money and you know you know I don't think anyone ever renegotiated their contract. I mean it didn't work that way so you know you got what you got but Generally, with cartoons, if you can't make it, they work around you and they set it up. Or, I mean, I've had to record in New York, you know, sometimes. I've had to wild line cartoons in New York when I was on a different series. So it's, it can be done, and it's done all the time. So, but, oh, yeah. but in their case, I don't know why. And they just decided to say, if you're not there, we'll get someone else to, to do it, which was a strange choice, I think. Did you do any jobs for Ninja Turtle-like voicing outside of the cartoon, like uh, for toys or commercials or any... The only thing that I did was, I think we did some promos for the toys at the same time, I think. I know we did promos for the show. Yeah. And I'm trying to remember if we did any toy promos, and I think we did one or two. There was a few of uh, the anti-drug things, too, that came up. That we definitely did. Yeah. That we definitely did, yeah, for the... Uh, they had a lot of little uh, turtle bits here and there. For the council, the um, I'm trying to think of the name of that council, the safety council or something. But there, yeah, right. I don't think it was there, but... The Partnership for a Drug-Free America yeah. or something, yeah. Yeah, we did. So it, it was one of those things where we would see them during the commercial breaks and yeah. everything. They, they had a lot of cool things coming out for Ninja Turtles at the time. Did you get any of the collectible items? Um, I have a couple. I have an ac a couple of action figures, Donatello action figures, that people have given me. <laughs> so, so I didn't get them at the time, but yeah, people have kind of given me the action figures. And, and Kevin um, gave me, I think, volume two, I think, of the original graphic novel. Going to the reunion, was, was that your first time seeing some of uh, yep. the cast in a long time? It sure was. And I didn't see Cam that day. 
Oh, because yeah. Because he came wasn't later, he right? came later and I had to leave, so yeah, so I didn't get to see him that day. So So the first time that the four of us got together was, was at PF Chang's. Oh. Um, planning for, <laughs> oh, planning for Rob's show. Planning for Rob got, show. He had a picture of all four of you together yeah. for that. Yeah. That was yeah. an amazing day. That was so much that, fun, yeah. Just seeing a reunion of you guys up there. Uh, wish we could have had a few more of the other characters like Irma and Shredder. Yeah. That would have been even wow. But we wouldn't have been able to fit it in his time slot. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> everyone would be have too many questions. We already had a lot. Sure. But uh, it was also interesting to have Bill Wolf in the audience at that Yes. Event. And uh, then there was also uh, one of the voice actors from the Four Kids series was in the audience. Uh, Michael Center Nicholas, who did Leonardo. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, he was up on the second floor. I actually was uh, communicating with Bill and Michael about the show. Yeah, I understand they were making major fun of us down on the stage. <laughs> uh, my, my, my wife told me that you know she was listening the, the comics were downstairs doing their thing and you know they were talking about these you know 60 year old AARP members upstairs <laughs> who were greeting hundreds of groupies so <laughs> it's a little embarrassing but yeah no I, I actually think that what you guys did there was amazing and great for the fans it would be I'm awesome glad. if you guys could do any more appearances if they, the opportunities come up I'm sure we will if some opportunities come up sure uh, conventions. This is something to think about. New York, Sandy. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> you know the big cons that have the names that can bring in people. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was an amazing event. Uh, have you done this with any other shows? Any type of reunions with the cast or anything like that? No. Nope. Interviews. No. Nope. No. No. This wow. is this is uh, this is the first time something like this has happened. And. With uh, voice acting credits over the years, well, how do you feel about the it now changing to where voice actors are getting uh, not just to where the normal voice actors are getting named with their credits, but now celebrities are coming into normal shows to do voice work? Well, yes, and um, and that has its good side and its bad side because because people that used to kind of make their living in voiceover find it much harder to do that now because. Yeah because a lot of work becomes kind of, you know, star oriented or celebrity oriented. And it used to be that, you know, film stars and television stars wouldn't go near voice voice acting or cartoon acting. Now they do it all the time. Which is nice for the fans, I think, but it's harder for um, the, the performers because there are fewer places to get, you know, the really good roles. And there's so many great voice actors out there. Yes, there are. Sometimes they're just putting people in for names. Kind of like, the for me, the 2007 movie, Sarah Michelle Gellar was only in there for the name. When they could have had anyone actually come in and perform April, they brought her in. And mm -hmm. same with the others in there, but they changed her character to kind of match Sarah in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's the only reason I was just... If she was April O'Neil, as we know her... I don't think I would have been as disappointed with the film, but uh, the fact that they changed her up. Now, you got into uh, politics a lot. I did, yeah. Did this start <laughs> at a young age, or did this start while you were voice acting? My passion for politics um, began at a very young age. It began with the John F. Kennedy campaign, so I was uh, 11. Um, so I was very young. Uh, I read uh, Profiles in Courage, you know, which was the book that he wrote. Uh, a tremendous book uh, about different people in, in public service who were courageous and were strong leaders, um, particularly in Congress. Uh, it's hard to find today. Um, and, uh, and I always loved politics. That was always kind of the other side of me was, uh, and not just politics, but policy, political science, government. Um, but when I went to college, um, uh, I was going to go for a political science degree, and then I chickened out, and I decided to go for a um, film degree um, at UCLA, but I wasn't able to finish, because um, uh, I was just working too much as an actor. So after that's a good reason for not being able after, to finish. After three years, I didn't finish, <laughs> but I wanted to go back to school. 
So in the 80s, um, I went back to school. I went to Cal State LA um, and finally took the plunge and decided to go for a political science degree. So I had to take some units over again in order to build up for that. But I got my political science degree um, and, uh, and then went on to law school um, and got my law degree, became a member of the bar. Um, and at the same time, I was getting active with the Screen Actors Guild. And so kind of there was just a, a bizarre series of things that happened. And at one point, I was doing Donatello. I was in law school, and I was president of the Screen Actors Guild. Um, that wasn't <laughs> and that wasn't the easiest time. Um, well, at least you, recording was only one or two days a week. <laughs> recording was only one or two days a week, but you know, and I sit there with the law book. Cam and, was commenting uh, on that. Yeah, and uh, it's true. It's true. And my highlighter, and, and then I, you know, keep looking up and you know, look to where I highlighted my line and, oh, it's time for me. And I lean forward and <laughs> I do my line and, okay, back there. <laughs> back of the law book. Um, but then after that, after I was president of the Guild, I was president of the Guild for seven years. Um, and I guess, you know, because Reagan had been president of the Guild, Charlton Heston had been president of the Guild, George Murphy, who became a U.S. Senator, was president of the Guild there was interest in me running for something. So, uh, so I ran for Congress um, and did not win. I came close. I, I ran against an incumbent um, and uh, came within uh, three points, I guess, of beating him. So it was, it was, it was considered to be a very close race. Um, in a district uh, here in Pasadena and Burbank, Glendale, which was considered to be not a uh, good ground for the Democratic Party, which is what I was representing. Um, it was very Republican at the time, but I had sensed that it was shifting. And so I decided to plunge and took the race on. And something really good came out of the race from my point of view because um, it showed you know, the, the, the party and it showed the party nationally that this was a winnable district. So while they didn't do it with me, uh, the f next time it came up, they dumped a lot of money into a candidate because they saw that they could win it. And so I'm glad that I had some effect in, in letting them know that, you know, instead of losing by, you know, 15 points, you can come really, really close. And when I came that close, then we were able to flip the district, and now the district has been Democratic since then, so. That's really cool. Which is neat, yeah. Which, yeah. Is, which is a neat thing, and, and um, so I've been, I haven't been active in politics since then. I ran for the assembly, didn't make it. Uh, so, and then my wife basically said no more. So <laughs> <laughs> she said, if you, if, if you win the lottery, okay. But if you don't win, because it's very expensive. I mean, it's amazingly expensive. And, and you're spending all your time fundraising, which is really not a fun thing to no. do. You know, now involved in different ways. I blogged for a while. Yeah. Um, I had a radio show for a while. A talk, uh, political well, talk I radio like show. I still go there, and it says you're on vacation. Well, I'm on permanent vacation. <laughs> you're on permanent yeah, vacation. yeah. Okay. I have to do something about that, or my webmaster <laughs> does. Um, yeah, I'm not doing that anymore. But it was a great time, and it I was. and I loved doing it, and I got to interview wonderful, wonderful people. As you say, uh, you are using your normal voice for Donatello. Yeah. And so I have to say, it was extremely amusing when I first learned about the political show. <laughs> uh, I sit down and listen to it, and I go, okay, I can see Donatello sitting there in the sewer. It's <laughs> Donatello, <laughs> yeah. That's who it was. You could take the old animators and just animate two sure. things, and it would match up, because that is your voice. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't a science geek. So I was different from Donatello that way. Yeah. I was so bad at science. So I was not a science geek, but I was a geek, nevertheless. Only it was politics and history and, you know, things like that. Uh, now, with uh, working on the, the Turtle Show, yeah. uh, another question there is, uh, do you remember any bloopers or uh, ad-libs that really stood out that made everyone just bust up at the set? No, because there were so many. Um, I don't. I don't remember any particular because uh, particularly Pat Fraley. 
Yeah. I mean, Pat, you, you couldn't keep Pat on script. Uh, so, so you never knew what was going to come out of his mouth. Um, and he always made us laugh. And, you know, and Rob and Cam. I probably did less of that. Um, I was more the straight arrow, as Donatello is. So. Yes. <laughs> you know, it's the script. I'm sticking the script. No, no, but... But um, uh, oh yeah, there was there was a lot of a lot of playing going on. Now with uh, the voice director Sue Blue, uh, was she there for all of the episodes, or was there times so when someone else was there? I remember her for all of them except the very beginning. She didn't do the oh, first five, yeah. I don't think. Um, um, so and then I remember her from there on. I think Stu Rosen did the other five, if I'm not mistaken, the first five. And he was the one who brought in uh, Rob and Townsend, right? Well, he okay. brought in all of us, yeah. I think. Yeah, I mean, all of us, you know. Um, they were working on Fraggle Rock at the time. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, I think, you know, since we were in the original group, yeah, that, that, that Stu was kind of responsible for helping to put the group together. And then, uh, and then Sue came in, I think, as soon as those five were over, as I recall. Was there any other characters in Turtles that you voiced that stood out that was... Um, different uh, from the, your normal sounding voice where like Bebop you had to do a different voice. There were a few but I cannot remember what they were but there were a few. I think I played a mad scientist in one. Um, I think I did a Peter Lorre in one. Oh, awesome. Yeah I think so because I, I think I did that kind of a guy. <laughs> <laughs> that oh, so cool. I think that's what I did. I, I, I seem to remember I did that but Maybe not. I don't know. No, but I think I did. <laughs> Maybe I just dreamt that. No, I did. I, I did sort of a Peter Lorre kind of a guy, and one one mad henchman or something. To <laughs> there was to, a lot of those in the series. Oh yeah, there were a lot of them. <laughs> yeah, if I saw them, I'd say, okay, that's me. But you know, without doing that, I don't know exactly what the names were. But now I'm going to have to listen for that. <laughs> yeah, but I did do a Peter Lorre at one point. I think I'm going to marathon after I get that DVD set. Oh. That's coming out, and like I need to sit down and just go through the show again. So the DV, the set is going to be the entire original. Yes. Oh Every, wow, really? It, it's shaped like the turtle van. That's amazing. An impressive set. <laughs> I need to get that. Wow. Yeah. So, but yeah, there's so much that you guys did in that series, and it's really outstanding. It's amazing that you guys were able to pull that much out. And keep well, it going as long as you did. That was amazing. Yeah, that really was. Now, with um, doing uh, hospital calls and stuff for children, how often were you guys uh, called in to uh, call and be there for the kids? I think Rob did it more than I did, but I did it every few weeks, I think. Now, since Ninja Turtles, have you worked on other shows that you can uh, share us about? Well, after Ninja Turtles, of course, I did SWAT Cats. Yes. Um, I did a show called, that was very short-lived, called Meatballs and Spaghetti, or Meatball and Spaghetti. Very strange show. Um, that we did, I think, at Hanna-Barbera. I did a show called Gravedale High that didn't last very long. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so after Turtles and Squat, Swat Cats, that was sort of about it. And then, then I really got into politics and, and kind of uh, haven't been doing cartoons since then. So. So, but if something comes up, I'm uh, here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We like his voice. Yeah. <laughs> You've been doing a lot of politics stuff since? Or? I've been doing politics. I've been teaching. Um, I'm teaching uh, acting for film and television at Cal State LA. Oh, that's cool. Uh, for the Master of Fine Arts program. Um, so I'm teaching that uh, in graduate school. Um, I've been teaching uh, entertainment and media law for uh, broadcasters and filmmakers. That's really nice. uh, I've been doing a lot of theater here um, and just kind of I'm I'm kind of just having fun now I you yeah. know I've been working working since I've been three so I just decided <laughs> I'm just gonna have fun you know if something comes up if, if, a, if a role comes up that I want to do I'll do it if I don't want to do it I won't do it and you know so it's just I finally have gotten to that place where I can do that and um, and that's nice. Uh, I did an indie movie um, that came out earlier this year, and the DVD is coming out October 9th, I think, called Losing Control. Um, and that's a cute little movie um, that was fun to do. Yeah. And uh, 
and it got released, which is unusual for an indie movie. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so, you know, different things come up that I'm getting to do. I'm getting to play Shakespeare. I'm getting to play um, some classics that I've never done. And uh, so it's kind of the time of my life when I kind of get to do things just for the heck of it. Now, I have a question on the Turtle fan side. Did you follow any of the other um, incarnations of Ninja Turtles ever? Not closely. I saw the first uh, couple of movies um, that I found very different from the original cartoon. Yeah. Uh, did not, I think I saw a few episodes of another cartoon series that was like a few years ago. Yeah, the 2003 yeah. Kids series. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. Um, a few episodes of that, but I haven't been closely following. I will definitely watch the new one. Um, <laughs> With Rob in it? Yes. Yeah, the Nickelodeon. Yeah. Wondering if you realize that people were following you for over 20 years. <laughs> it's, ama it's pretty amazing. It really is pretty amazing. And, and actually, because of the contact now that I've had with the other three guys, you know, I'm probably going to go back now and try to see. I want to see the 2007 movie. I want to see, you know, some other things that, you know, I haven't. Now, is there anything you would like to say to the Turtle fans who uh, have been watching you all these years? Well, let me say this. I, I, uh, I find this all pretty unbelievable. <laughs> and, um, I just thought I was starting a little cartoon series. I had no idea that it was going to become a, a, a phenomenon. And it's all due to you. And I want to thank you uh, because you've stuck with us. Um, you've stuck with Turtles through every form and iteration and I think uh, that that's that's amazing loyalty and uh, and I really appreciate it so you know what I have to say you know what I'm gonna say and I hope you'll say it with me turtle power thank you we'll catch you next time on Calabunga Corner <laughs> <laughs>